office, which I went to get, but I also had to print my sermon and just plumb forgot it there. Our copier's not working here, so I'm not really in the, the usual uh, flow of things. So. Thank you, Larry. All right. So we have nothing else. Sorry about that. Let me get reconfigured here. Okay. <coughs> well, the Lord gave us some lovely rain last night to be thankful for. Lovely sunshine today. Uh, I do see we have a few folks coming in, so I'm going to go slow with the announcements to allow them time to get settled. But good to be with you all. Good to have you, Brother Ron. Thankful that you're on the other side of the night, and uh, it's good to see you smiling. So, um, it seemed like I was going to mention something else. Oh, yeah, just generally, I, have, you, have you noticed there's a little bit of a difference with the property? It's <laughs> just a little, right? <laughs> I regret I was not able to be here uh, to get some video and photos of them sanding the, the parking lot down. But my understanding is the way they did it, they had a big uh, carbide circle and like ground it down, suck the sand that they made, and they'll repurpose that for other pavement. Isn't that something? I mean, I, I'm still just blown away by this excavator like Gideon. If I had my druthers, I'd just be putting up a lawn chair watching that thing all day long. It's amazing. You've seen in the back, probably, there's hills higher than the building and a very deep area. And uh, the boys were getting excited. Oh, are they building a pool? Well, first of all, it's not our property, so even if they were, we don't have access. Although I, I, I always am joking that part of the deal was they were going to make a, a, a small uh, water slide park that I had access to from my office. And um, I think that's the first time Elder Renner laughed at that, actually. <laughs> Usually, <laughs> So um, no pool, as far as I know. But even if there were, we, we wouldn't be there. Um, but it's going really well, as you can see. It's, it took three years for him to break ground, Mr. Harrigan, but now it's going fast. They do anticipate possibly the end of the year will be done. And I'm starting to believe that <laughs> it's pretty amazing. And it's fun to watch. You know, I, um, I'm behind on posting a lot of this, but I have gotten a lot of videos and a lot of photos for our YouTube page, uh, a special page playlist to just see the thing and pictures on our uh, Flickr page. I haven't been able to put them up, uh, but uh, in a little while I aim to give you an update because it's pretty fun to, it's pretty fun to watch. It's pretty amazing. I don't know how many of you have uh, any experience with construction, but it's, it's pretty amazing to watch. That, that excavator just, you know, if you think about sticking a shovel into the dirt, just trying to get it started, I mean, that thing just came down to ground that hadn't been turned and it just went I mean, it just scooped like nothing. <laughs> you know, it's just amazing, it's just amazing. Anyhow, I also did want to share, like I, I know that um, it can be a little bit of a bittersweet thing in terms of the property has been ours and it's not ours now. Gabriel seems to be the most concerned about that. Of course, we lost our lights and our palm trees. And, um, but I just want to encourage you, uh, look beyond the moment. Uh, it's gonna be beautiful. It's gonna be so nice. We, we were not using the property I mean, since I was born, my understanding is other than the office, I think there's a pig roast once back there, but <laughs> you know, it really hasn't been used. It's, uh, I'm pretty sure our neighbor's gonna be really happy about the gophers that he thinks we're farming. Although I suspect they could be all running up the hill to him right now. <laughs> I have noticed we have rabbits over here again. I'm thinking lots of things are being moved around. But uh, be encouraged, it's, it's just going to be beautiful. It's gonna be brand new homes. All the area will be developed, the landscape. It'll be a really nice environment for the neighborhood, for our church. Uh, we were able to benefit from funds, Mr. Harrigan will. And uh, also, just keep praying that the Lord uh, has certain people he intends to live there uh, that would be brethren and perhaps even uh, be worshiping here with us. So uh, let's look at the news you can use. Not a, a lot to report, but let's look there before we enter into worship. Um, Tonight, if you're working on the Shorter Catechism, we're on the Tenth Commandment now, as it brings us through the Ten Commandments, and uh, Shorter Catechism number 80, Duties Required, uh, in Thou Shalt Not uh, Covet, and then Hebrews 13, verse 5, a verse that I think most of us pretty much do have memorized, so I might do a little extra. Anyone else? Anyone else? <laughs> but it's a good, uh, I know we often have the last part memorized, there's a little bit at the beginning that maybe sometimes we forget, but I think important to remember how it's connected to, and he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, calling upon us to be content.
content and without covetousness, because contentment is the opposite of, of covetousness. So uh, memory work for that tonight, I encourage you to be looking at that. This Thursday, you uh, a couple of scheduling issues. The lady study is postponed. I've said until May, because I think that's probably most likely, uh, unless you ladies tell me otherwise, um, halfway through April now. But uh, most likely until May. We have shifted the period piece, I double checked, a week earlier. So it doesn't actually fall on the same week as when the lady study was. So maybe you'll we'll, maybe we'll be able to keep it. Uh, I know we have a lot of moving parts here. Uh, Wednesday prayer and Bible study. Uh, we're going to do psalm singing and elder-led prayer and enjoy devotion together. And I refuse to teach the book on work for now, as you heard me say Wednesday. I'm going to go at least four weeks so that a certain brother is encouraged to stay home if he needs to. Okay? But after about four weeks, we'll come back to that. Uh, I'll probably have some uh, videos that I'm thinking about for devotions. Yeah, you know who I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> you can do what you want, but I'm not going to enable it. <laughs> So, uh, but we do, of course, want to also ensure that uh, we can all start it together since he requested it. Um, I, I mentioned in Sabbath class, I think most of you saw the email, but especially please be in prayer for Pastor Jeff Stuyvesant uh, and uh, his kids, Abby and Nathan, and of course, Gibsonia, RPC, uh, Seminary Community also, he's a professor there. He lost uh, Tabitha Friday night. They were with her, um, especially this is his First day going without his wife and without their mother. Pastor Dr. Carl Truman is preaching for them today, so I'm really thankful to know that. But uh, especially please uh, be keeping him in prayer. And as he was looking forward to the sermons going to be on the certainty of the resurrection, and that's really all our hope, because we all are facing death, and we will one day be dead. Our bodies will be laid in the ground. What is our only hope? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, we have no hope unless there is the hope of the resurrection, but we do because Christ is raised from the dead, and we will be raised from the dead. And that's why we celebrate the Lord's Day, the Sabbath day now on the first day of the week, because it's the day that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. We're hoping in him as the first fruits of our resurrection. So we can face that, we can deal with it, we can talk about it when we're in a society more and more that doesn't want to. Because we have the hope, and as we know, we'll be led to the valley of the shadow of death, but actually we won't taste the second death because we've already got the first resurrection. So we're encouraged um, by the larger catechism that speaks about uh, where do Christians go as soon as they die. They immediately go to a greater degree of glory into the intermediate state uh, without their bodies before the resurrection and the final time on the last day, but already in the presence of God, no longer sinning, uh, rejoicing with our brothers and sisters who have gone before us there, no longer held down by sin and the effects of death by sin in our, in our bodies. So that is our hope. That's why we're here. We don't really belong. I mean, I shouldn't say we don't belong here. God is worthy of our praise and glory, but that's what we're particularly here for. We are hoping in Christ and in the resurrection and the life to come. Otherwise, what do you get, God? But we have everything, and we're going to inherit the earth. I really look forward to that, too. In the resurrection, and the new heavens, and the new earth, all these places I haven't gotten to see, probably won't get to see. That really depresses me, actually, a lot when I think about places I want to get to. But then I remind myself, i got eternity to enjoy all of God's glorious creation with a resurrected body that won't feel like I'm 50. Now, I know a lot of you are going to say, come on, you whippersnapper. But <laughs> I'm getting the mailings now, and I'm having all kinds of things. And uh, I look forward to the day where I can enjoy it more in my, my youthful body again, not affected by sin. Just all these hopes that we have. And so our brother today with his family goes to church and has a, a brother preach for him about the resurrection. And that is our hope and that is our witness. Amen? Amen. All right. Let me read for you uh, the quote from William Secker this week from The Consistent Christian. I've given it this title. Heaven is not earned by us, but given to us by God in Christ. And uh, here's the quote. Heaven is not the product of man's labor, but the token of God's good pleasure. Remember, it's a gift. It's the gift of God, Ephesians says, not of works, lest any man should boast, but it's a gift from our Father who it pleases him. Think about that. Now, remember, any parent who's gotten a gift, for their children, 
takes pleasure in them enjoying the gift. And sometimes, you know, uh, for instance, uh, Gabriel lost his first tooth this week. It's so cute. You know, it's got that little wisp. Now he was so excited. And um, so I, we say the daddy fairy. I wasn't playing around with any fairy, really. So I, you know, there's no fairies. But so we joke, the daddy fairy is going to leave. But he tried to give me, he slipped the quarters back under my door. No, you don't have to do this. I am giving it to you like you did all my children. You're going to keep it and you're going to like it. You know? And I enjoy giving it to you. Don't take away my pleasure of blessing you. I mean, come on, it's a couple of quarters. You know? But the idea is the Father takes pleasure. But what we do need to recognize is, yeah, his tooth, our works don't, don't earn that. It's a gift, but it is a gift. It's a gift to be thankful for and to receive and to enjoy. For instance, if you give a gift to your child and there's no reason for them not to like it, it was on their wish list or whatever, and they're not thankful, uh, that doesn't give pleasure, right? Uh, speaking in anthropomorphisms, the Lord uh, takes pleasure in our gratefully receiving his gracious gift of eternal life. Yes, we will live this out with good works to give him glory, which he's ordained before the foundation of the world. That was some of the quote last week. But as we approach the Lord in worship today, let us be reminded that we don't earn heaven. We cannot earn heaven. It's a gracious gift of God. So let us approach the throne of grace with confidence, seeking mercy and grace in our time of need. Hear now the word of the Lord as we prepare for worship today. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Thus, beloved, O magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Together let us seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near through our Savior whose name is Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins and says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. And he promises that whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. Let's pray. O Lord, we come to confess you together before men, before one another, before this world, in our public worship, which we thank you. We have freedom and no persecution in doing. And so, Lord, let us boldly proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ and his kingship over all. We do glorify and anoint uh, and, and adore you, O Lord. We do uh, confirm one another, speaking together the truth that you are Lord of lords and King of kings, God of gods. O Lord, we do thank you that you are holy, 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 and have called upon us to be holy as you are holy and have made us holy in the Holy One, the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, and applied this blessing to us by the Holy Spirit. May we hallow your name. Yet we are convicted, O Lord, of our sin and our unclean lips and being an unclean people before you. And so we pray, Lord, that you do bless us and forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness as we also not only confess Jesus the Savior, but we confess our sins. Thought, word, and deed. By what we've done, and left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, nor our neighbor as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, have mercy on us, forgive us, lead us, renew us, and cause us to walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. And, O oh Lord, we pray you bless these means of grace in your ordained uh, service of worship to you that is a means of grace to us. O oh Lord, transform us by the renewing of our mind. Wash us and lift us up in your purity. For the pure, uh, the pure in heart shall see God. O oh Lord, we pray that you do indeed uh, help us to grow in holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Lord, we pray that you show us your glory and let it shine on our faces. Bless us with your presence. Fill this place with your spirit. And Holy Spirit, work in our hearts. And lead us all, we pray, to worship you in spirit and truth as the Father seeks. And let us 
us go away saying it was good for us to have drawn near to God as we draw together as brethren. And we pray indeed for one another's blessing and felicity and peace. Lord, guide us now in worship. Lift up your name and lift up our hearts and bless us to persevere unto the end as we look for your return and we say in the spirit, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. Love, open your psalters with me now to page 263. Page 263. So as you know, we began uh, singing Psalm 119, uh, as we have our uh, psalms that will open our morning and evening worship with for a time. Uh, we're going to start just singing over time, it'll take a while, uh, through Psalm 119. For a month or so, we'll keep the same selection morning and evening as we advance uh, to pray that the Lord really helps us to learn and internalize and memorize uh, the word and even uh, be well acquainted with the tunes to facilitate our worship at home as well. Uh, but we start singing uh, verses 1 through 8 of Psalm 119. And again, notice how it's speaking about being blessed in verse 1 and verse 2. How blessed are we? How do you want to be blessed? If you want to be blessed, the answer is here in the word. We'll sing it back to God, but he will also teach us with it as we sing his word back to him. Please stand. Da 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 Blessed are they that undefiled and straight are in the way who in the Lord's proposal
answers how we can be in God's holy presence, and that is he makes us holy by his means, not our means. And uh, we saw in chapter 10 the concern to sanctify God, to treat him as holy, uh, that, that we be careful not to have temporal consequences. In particular, it was in the context of worship. Uh, I think I'll refrain from reviewing uh, so that I don't get distracted from our, our study now in the next chapter uh, 11 here of Leviticus. But remember, this is all the ceremonial system of the tabernacle, later to be the, um, uh, the temple. The, the way that the Lord has prescribed um, the type and shadow of how we can be saved truly through what they are prefiguring, Christ who is the veil to the true Holy of Holies, who is the true Lamb of God who takes away our sins, who is the priest after the order of Melchizedek in the tribe of Judah with an unceasing priesthood that always uh, abides for us. Have those things in view as we begin now, chapter 11 of Leviticus. Hear now the word of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Whatsoever parteth the hoof, and is cloven-footed, and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that shall ye eat. Nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that chew the cud, or among, of them that divide the hoof, as the camel, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof. He is unclean unto you. And the coney, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And the hare, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And the swine, though he divide the hoof and be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cud, he is unclean to you. Or the flesh shall ye not eat, and their carcass shall ye not touch, they are unclean chapter will go on to have these dietary laws, and we know, especially from Acts chapter 10, that the Lord in the coming of Christ has fulfilled those laws, and uh, there are no longer specifics that we're called upon to follow. God makes this abundantly clear with the vision uh, with Peter on the rooftop, concluding that he is now allowing the Gentiles in um, to go there to see especially powerfully that these laws, uh, in specifics, are not something we need to follow anymore, but we do want to remember the general principle of what they're teaching. Notice this comment of being unclean. Unclean. The Lord in the, in the, in the book of Leviticus, throughout the scriptures as well, is teaching that idea of being unclean. Right? You need to be made clean. There's washing. Isaiah, when he sees the thrice holiness of God in chapter 6, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. He needs to be washed. The angel brings the hot coal from the from the altar to cleanse. So we need to have that sense of needing to be clean. But in here, it's, I think, the particular the idea of being separate. And uh, these dietary laws, I know some will try to point out uh, maybe there are benefits in not eating certain of these animals. So, for instance, what we're most familiar with is verse 7, the swine or the pigs. You know, we're most familiar. There's a lot of other things besides pigs that we're not allowed to eat. And, of course, the Orthodox Jews still wouldn't touch these things today. Um, I'm not sure, as I've, as, I've, as I've preached through it, I'm not so sure that there really are necessarily any uh, health benefits uh, that could be behind it more. I think you could argue they're mostly arbitrary. You know, at this time, we wouldn't, I've always kind of said simply, we wouldn't have been able to eat pepperoni pizza. We'd have to have pizza with something else, you know. Um, but now we can. But, but why? What was the purpose here? The sense of being separate, right? When you... Don't do certain things that God tells us not to do. Uh, there's a separating us from the world, a separating of the culture, and that still applies even in terms of how we would eat, uh, how you know whether we eat or drink. Paul says, or whatsoever we do, let us do all for the glory of God. So how we would approach having a meal, how we would certainly want to pray before we eat, which is going to be different. I mean, setting it apart, not in the same sense of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, but we're praying the Lord to bless it, we're acknowledging his hand in it, seeking to enjoy his blessing with it. Um, this is not something the world does. Right? And I have in mind uh, a Norman Rockwell uh, painting. Uh, I would argue not just illustrations, I mean he was an artist. <laughs> but but um, uh, it's, 
picture of a, of a grandma uh, in a cafe where um, uh, we used to call them greasy spoons in Pittsburgh, but uh, uh, losing the word. Uh, but uh, you know, a restaurant, and you see her head bowed with her hands in prayer, with I assume her grandson praying, and there are other people watching. I don't know what's going on there. And, and this is the idea that, you know, at the time, well, why would you do these things? Because the Lord has forbid it. And the Lord is our God. And one thing to say to you, beloved, if God still had this requirement today, would you be willing to keep it? If the Lord still required you not to eat pepperoni on Tuesday, would you be willing to do it? See, because that really is the main question. It goes back to the Garden of Eden. If the Lord says, don't eat of that one fruit, he could have made it any fruit. It was a test of whether we'll obey God, whether we'll trust God, whether we're interested to be identified with God or the devil in the world. So keep in mind that uh, though these dietary laws are no longer binding because of the coming of Christ, they, they serve a purpose of communicating the need to be separate from the world, cleansed, in community and fellowship with God, called out of the world. Some things in Leviticus we would recognize as still applicable. Some things are not. These are not. But that abiding principle that if you are the Lord's, you're called to be holy. You're called to live a clean life. And if we just apply this more generally to things we know, thinking through the Ten Commandments, you are to live the law of liberty and love of purity. Right now, we just started on Tuesday night with the men's study, our study of Jonathan Edwards' book, Charity and Its Fruits which is a study of 1 Corinthians 13. And we start at the part that says, love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. And though we were recognizing what we think are probably important connections with what came before about thinking no evil, uh, we're following him and agree it's appropriate that most of it's just looking about the idea of rejoicing in the truth. And he's pointing out, really, it has the idea of living a good, pure, holy lifestyle. And the chapter is something like a heart filled with grace naturally is going to want to live a holy life. And uh, that is God's call on us. And he's pointing out with many scriptures, God's purpose of election is that we would be living a holy life. God's purpose in Christ redeeming us is that we would be living a holy life. Um, and we remembered in First Thessalonians, I want to say chapter 4, verse 3, I usually have to look it up. Um, but what is God's will for us? Our sanctification. And of course, we can't be with God unless we have been sanctified. Now we know definitively, positionally, he makes us holy in Christ. He sanctifies us in our union with Christ and his paying for our sins and living a perfect righteous life and crediting us with that. But still, what does it say in Hebrews? Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Uh, so if that holiness is, if we have the Holy Spirit in us, we're going to want to bear the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, we're going to want to see ourselves growing in holiness making progress in purity. And remember, that was emphasized as what's implied when we were studying the sixth petition of the Lord's Prayer. And lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. Deliver us from evil. And we remember we saw the prayer of Jabez in 1 Corinthians 4. He prays the same last petition. Lord, keep me from evil. And there he adds uh, something like that I don't grieve myself because that's what sin will do to us. We'll grieve the Holy Spirit, but we'll also grieve ourselves conscience. So may the Lord remind us that we are to be holy as he is holy. We saw that in Leviticus, that's four times commanded. Be ye holy as I am holy. And we saw that Peter, and I think it was Timothy, quote that. But it comes from Leviticus four times. I've made you holy, so be holy. Live out that holiness as I am holy. This is not a concern of many Christians today. There's a excusing away and writing off God's clear commands about how we're to live our lives. We, we, we want to be just like the world still and the filth of the world and call it what it isn't. But the Lord calls on us to live a separate, clean, holy life and that's the principle that certainly remains. But of course we can still apply the truth ultimately in this, whether therefore we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Love, turn with me now uh, to Deuteronomy chapter Turn ahead, past numbers to Deuteronomy chapter 5. 
Here is how to live a holy life, the Ten Commandments, the second time given to them, what God expects of his covenant people for every generation, as he's faithful to still be our covenant God. In the land that isn't holy, in the place, it's supposed to be a, a holy influence, right? Jesus says we're to be salt and light. Uh, and this is the way, the law of liberty, the way of love and life, but it's the way of living a clean, clean, holy life. Uh, but we remember that as we read it, that the law would condemn us for not doing that. We remember that Jesus Christ, for Christians, has paid the penalty of violating God's law. Sin is the transgression of God's law. And all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3, Romans 6. But being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Remember in our bulletin, we don't have heaven because of our works. We have heaven because of God's grace and favor. But having been made clean, here is the way to lead and live a life that is clean. Uh, God's law, God's ways. Uh, think of what we uh, sang in Psalm 19, verses 7 through 14 last week, about what it says God's law does. It's clean, it converts, it blesses, it grows. It's to be desired more than honey, more than gold. May we approach it with that heart, and may the Lord, by his grace, uh, help us to live more like him and less like the world. And as we've heard in recent Sabbath classes, such as by Dr. Sinclair Ferguson, the more the Lord helps us to lead and live such a different life from the world, we won't need to worry about big evangelism programs. Not that we shouldn't be trying to get the word out in different ways, but we will be an evangelism track. Our life will be an evangelism track, and people will ask us, what is this hope that you have in me? Why are you living so different? And that's the best witness. That's the best evangelism we can do. May the Lord bless our love of him and one another greater as he would, he would help us love his law and grow in it. Here now the Ten Commandments, Deuteronomy 5, 6 to 21. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt have none other gods before me. Thou shalt not make thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore, the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Honor thy father and thy mother as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, that thy days may be prolonged and that it may go well with thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill. Neither shalt thou commit adultery, neither shalt thou steal, neither shalt thou bear false witness against thy neighbor, neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife, neither shalt thou covet thy neighbor's house, his field, or his manservant, or his maidservant, his ox, or his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. We'll have in view verse 21, which... Uh, mirrors verse 17, I believe, in Exodus 20. The Tenth Commandment is what we are studying in our evening time uh, as we use the Westminster Standards to guide us in studying God's system of doctrine and practice, uh, what duty he requires of us, and uh, what he requires of us to believe in him, namely teaching. And uh, we're studying that in the evening. Remember, thou shalt not covet. 
And remember, the opposite of covetousness is contentment. Remember, Paul says in First Corinthians, or excuse me, in Philippians, especially four thirteen, I've learned whatsoever thing to be content. Right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Actually, the verse, but the context is to be content, mostly whether I abound or whether I am abased. I've learned to be content. What greater strength could you have, right, than to be content in all things? Um, Again, Paul also says in the New Testament that covetousness is idolatry. Think of that as we think of the first command, you should have no other gods before me. As we covet, we're making things idols, which violates the second command as well. May the Lord purify our hearts, and may he help us with our hearts, because, of course, coveting is a heart issue. Right? Have all these things ultimately come down to, to the heart. If we're not coveting our neighbor's things, we're less likely to kill our neighbor, lie to our neighbor, steal from our neighbor, disrespect our neighbor, you know, those kinds of things. And certainly that relates to the first command because uh, John says in, in the letter to John, if we, if we don't love our neighbor, then we don't love God, right? Just can't be. So may the Lord help us to indeed fulfill the ultimate uh, command is to love. Love God, love one another better. Uh, I want to encourage you also to have in view um, the counsel of all the commandments. We're going to sing in Psalm, uh, in this, I think it is Psalm 119, before the sermon, that all his words are our counselors. And we're going to study the importance from Proverbs of having many counselors to be safe and to safely guide others, actually, that we wouldn't fall as a community. Um, and keep in mind all of his commands and our counsel, that are our counselors. And have you Psalm 1 that says, Blessed is the man who walks in the counsel of the godly, in the, in the ways of the Lord's people, in the way of God's law, and contrast that to the way of walking with the world, and walking in the ways of the world, and letting them be our counselors. And what for particularly is brought to our attention is the end of both. The end of those who walk in the counsel of the world and the wicked will be like dust in the wind. But the end of the way of those who walk in the law of the Lord and seek the counsel of God's people in his ways is, what is that end? A tree. The picture is a tree planted by the river with uh, green leaves. And that's, that's the distinction. May the Lord therefore help us to love his law and grow in it and let it be our counselors. And may we see people that would counsel us with his word. Let us pray. Our Lord God in heaven, we do thank you for your law, which is good and holy and righteous and converts the soul and cleanses. Lord, we do pray indeed you will keep us from, uh, uh, from violating your law, that you would keep our hearts and our words uh, right in your ways according to you who are our rock. Lord, we pray you would keep us firmly planted on the rock as we would give ourselves to the counsel of your word and to many counselors who would guide us in its wisdom. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be like the tree planted by the river and that our life would produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit blessing others. Lord, that our life would be leaving a legacy of Christ and his word and the abundant life and the peace of God that is not of this world. Lord, we pray uh, that you would work this in these means of grace as we give ourselves to you this day on your holy day. And, oh, Lord, we do lift up and want to thank you for seeing our brother and elder Ron Renner through his knee replacement this week. We thank you, Lord, uh, for letting that be a success. And we ask and pray now, Lord, that you bless him with recovery through the pain, through the process of rehabilitation. Help him, Holy Spirit, Comfort him with our prayers and encouragement. And uh, Lord, we pray that you help him to follow the guidance of his doctor and uh, his wise counsel as we consider the message today, that you will give him the best and lasting healing. And Lord, we are thankful for these modern uh, things of medical care, to have these as even options. But we do pray you'd help him through the difficult uh, process of healing. And indeed, Lord, bless his body to respond well and recover well. Help Linda as she cares for him. 
oh lord we pray for our brother andre who has not been here for some time now help us to be stopping by his house soon as the phone ever seems to be working we pray lord that you help him we don't know what could be keeping him away we pray lord that you help him and recover him help us to do what we can to seek him out and we pray you would restore him back here with those who he speaks of as his family and his home lord we pray you protect him from anything that could be help, uh, getting in the way or hurting this and hurting him almighty god uh, we do thank you uh, for our brother matthew being here this morning and seeking you out we thank you for keeping him safe on his recent deployment and for him being here now in the morning as well as the evening and just pray your great, rich blessings upon him according to what we're studying and seeing here in these scriptures. Blessed is the man who follows after you in your ways and seeks the counsel of the godly and the wisdom of your word. We pray, Lord, that you will bless and reward him as he seeks first your kingdom and your righteousness. Please bless and provide for all uh, the concerns he shared with us in his life. Meet his needs, Lord, and uh, give him patience and trust you in the process. We pray that, Lord, for all of us. I pray even for myself as uh, uh, have been struggling, Lord, to find that tent-making job, uh, not without significant effort. And uh, even thinking of applying the sermon today, Lord, and perhaps seeking counsel in other ways uh, to explore things I might not be thinking or new directions that wouldn't even be something I know to look at. Pray, Lord, you would provide and guide our steps and, uh, Lord, that you will meet my family's needs and the church, and that you will keep us going, oh, Lord. We thank you for the progress uh, with the property. We pray uh, thanksgiving that the ground has been broken and then some. We've been waiting for three years, praying for Mr. Harrigan, thankful for his investment in us in purchasing the property. And we pray, Lord, your great blessing upon him now for all of his risk and great investment. We pray that this will go as smoothly and quickly as it looks like it will. That you'll bless him, Lord, with uh, having many interested in purchasing these units. Lord, that you'll send wonderful neighbors to us. And Lord, that we'll be able to witness to them. And that there may even be those who live there who seek to be part of this church. And that you'll do a special, a special work and witness still with this property uh, indirectly, Lord, uh, as an aspect of ministry here. Oh, Lord, we do pray indeed that if it would be your will you would provide a tent making job that would be a, a natural uh, and obvious overlap and outwork of our ministry in a sense. Lord we do pray for uh, Fernanda and Carmelita, especially Carmelita who's got the cold hitting her heart now pray for the boys uh, Gabriel, Gideon, Juliana and Gaius who's getting sick again we pray Lord that you would comfort and help them through and heal them and uh, Lord as we look ahead to a busy month for Abraham, including this week. Uh, keep him, Lord, uh, and support and sustain him and bless him with all these opportunities. And, uh, we pray especially your blessing on all the preparations and then his music trip next, uh, the following week. And we pray, Lord, that you bless him with the dance coming up this week and other things that you'll richly reward him, Lord, for his love of you and serving you in this church as a covenant son. Lord, we do pray your blessing on all of our people who are in school. We lift up Rachel, Olivia, and Caitlin to you. And of course, Abraham and Isaac and Gabriel, that you will bless their schoolwork. Help them as they're uh, looking to finish the race well for the spring semester. Lord, bless them to get through the busyness and help them to do it all as unto the Lord. And let them learn and grow from it, Lord. Uh, let it not just be accomplishing these things to qualify for other things, but Lord, let it indeed be uh, growth for them at this opportunity uh, that is unique and short. Almighty God, we uh, want to thank you for your holy day of rest and worship, and we pray that you help us to rest and worship and get your counsel now from the Holy Spirit and through your word and through wisdom and many counsels, counselors as your word will teach us. Bless us, O oh Lord. Speak your truth to us. Let your servants hear and be transformed by the renewing of our mind as we give our heart and ears to meditation uh, upon your teachings and the wise counsel of others. And we thank you in Jesus' name, all your people say, Amen. 
Beloved, would you open your Psalters with me now? Back to Psalm 119, page 265. And this is not next in order. Next in order, we'll sing this evening, opening up our worship. We're skipping ahead to another part of Psalm 19, verses 17 through 24 on page 265, as we prepare for the sermon. Uh, Proverbs 11, 14, and many other Proverbs are going to teach us the importance of getting wise counsel to live wisely, to make wise choices, to have the best blessing on our lives, but also, as we'll see, really even more importantly in terms of how we lead others in the blessing. What's emphasized is the multitude of counselors. And we need to be getting wisdom from many people. We need to be seeking advice from many different people in different situations that we can get a sense from different perspectives and look for commonalities and things. But most importantly, what we want to see, uh, not that we can't be getting advice even from those in the world not in Christ related to certain things that are appropriate from experiences, uh, it may be a certain line of work, a uh, certain kind of house, or something we're looking at. Uh, people who have ex bought or experienced or done these things. But in particular, we want wisdom and the counsel of a multitude of counselors from brethren in the Lord. Especially those who are more studied and experienced in the Christian faith. We want to be seeking wisdom in, in many. And ultimately counseling us with the word of God, which is what's counseling us in Proverbs today. So verse 24 is why we're seeing this in preparation. My comfort and my heart's delight, thy testimonies be. And they in all my doubts and fears are counselors to me. May the Lord counsel us as we seek his word back to him in prayer. Please stand in your name. settings and uh, we've had the microphone kicking in and out a lot recently 
Hopefully, you know, once I think I've fixed it, then I haven't. But I think we discovered what to do and have fixed our mixer. It, what turned out, we discovered last week together, uh, is that it kept restarting, rebooting, and then we would lose the mic. And that affects uh, what goes into the camera, so then there's silence for those watching online. Uh, we think we fixed it, so that, but I had forgotten to plug the cable that comes from the sound system into the camera because it's much, much better audio quality. So uh, hopefully that we have fixed it. And uh, anyway, is also to explain uh, to people who could be watching and uh, fear we'll get it in there now so we don't forget. Proverbs 11, 14, let me start the recorder down here. And uh, also I've got that plugged in for better quality now too. Thankfully the Lord uh, has helped us figure it out. And I do, I do want to thank Isaac for filling in last week when Abe was sick and thank Abraham for helping me, helping me do a lot of testing uh, to, to fix these things as well. And as it turned out, uh, part of that, Mrs. Ms. Cervantes uh, helping us when she noticed we were testing online, <laughs> she, she was commenting that was helpful. So we're, we're getting things back. Hopefully, hopefully you don't have distractions with the sound system. Hopefully those watching online uh, as well can, can hear properly again. But Proverbs eleven fourteen is our is our scripture for us this morning. And uh, there are a number of Proverbs I am going to reference that are close by, so you might keep it marked and open. Uh, I, I won't really turn the page with you, so to speak. I've got it in my notes. But just to bring to your attention, there are, uh, there are a number of Proverbs that say almost verbatim and often very much similarly what we're going to have today. Proverbs eleven fourteen, and And let me say to you, um, I, I don't have anything or anyone in view. I was just praying to the Lord about what he would have me preach on. As you know, I'm pretty extra busy uh, seeking tent making, and also there's been a lot of extra stuff with the kids with hospital things and SATs, and just, just a lot of other things, uh, getting ready for things. So uh, I thank you for understanding. I'm not yet back in our exegetical series in Deuteronomy. And so um, often I'll be inspired by something, uh, but uh, today in particular, I just was asking God to guide me, and this is where I felt he led me. Um, and I, I was praying that I trust people will, will need it, and I wouldn't even have known that. That's often what happens. I may not ever know, but uh, I'll trust the Lord has a reason for this for us. He certainly does for me. You'll hear me preach to myself in the, in the sermon a little bit. But Proverbs eleven fourteen has great wisdom to offer us. Of course, the whole book of Proverbs is about giving us wisdom. And wisdom is to know how to live life wisely, live right, life morally right the way the Lord guides, and then have its blessings instead of its curses. And in particular, the Lord's going to give us wisdom about how to be getting that wisdom in a certain way uh, in our verse today that I'll highlight. Proverbs 11, verse 14. Hear now the word of the Lord. Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Uh, let me read that verse for you again, since it's brief. Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. And what I'm wanting us to focus on is the second part of the verse. It is in contrast to the first part of the verse. We'll touch on that because it emphasizes something to us. But what we're focusing on is in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Not just that we wouldn't have no counsel, that we would have some counsel, but notice a multitude of counselors, that we'd be seeking counsel and advice from different people, different sources, to bring it all together to help us in making decisions in life. And you've, you've probably heard it said, uh, I've seen this many times uh, in um, Places of uh, of a corporate situation for a for a you know a CEO or can be thinking about this related to someone who is president or even a king. Uh, the 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 comment is something like this: If you're going to be best at being a boss, you need to have people around you who are smarter than you are. It might sound counterproductive. Aren't I supposed to be the smartest guy? I mean, if I'm not. Can I have confidence in leading? But actually, the best way to have confidence, to give the best leadership, we need to have 
wise, smart people around us who in their particular um, professions or uh, in their particular expertise can give us wisdom from extra study, extra experiences that we cannot afford ourselves. And especially a person who's in a, a broader leadership position that has to manage over many different things needs wise counselors. So when a president is elected, he starts to put together a cabinet, right? And that would very much apply to this verse. You want to have wisdom in who you select, but what we recognize in formal leadership is usually, at least in our blessed situation, uh, whatever challenges we have in the multitude of counselors. And this certainly relates to the idea of plurality of elders in church leadership as well. And uh, we'll touch on that a little bit as well. But if you want to be a good leader of others, have people around you advising you that are smarter and more experienced than you are. And don't be intimidated by that. Be thankful and look for that because they will help you see things and do things or help you see things and not do things, uh, avoiding mistakes and instead maximizing opportunities. And that's what we're looking at today, focusing on the second part of the verse here in Proverbs eleven fourteen, in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. A Hebrew word for counsel in the first part of the verse could be guidance. Where there is no counsel, the people fall. So we need counsel. We need guidance so that we would guide the people, guide them well. The concern is how we lead others. And how are we to lead others? Into safety. The last part of our verse, safety. Now, interestingly, the Hebrew word there uh, is, uh, is, uh, is really the, the root for the word salvation. You could translate it salvation. And it looks like the word Yeshua, which is the name of Jesus. And so when we think of safety, it's safety and often being saved out of danger and problems and certainly saved from a life of despair and ruin and more importantly, saved from where this life is headed outside of Christ. Now, how is this all to be had? How are we to have such safety in counsel? How are we to have such salvation in helping saving others? It is by having counselors. But notice, not making decisions by yourself, first of all. Not you having the counsel only of me, myself, and I, which you and I are always very tempted of because it's quicker and we don't, ha we don't have to hear things we may not want to have to hear that could slow us down. Some of us who are task oriented have especially got to be listening today and I would be raising my hand. <laughs> So we certainly are not enough to be our own counselor. Uh, also, we're not just asking for advice from one person or one perspective. Of course, there's a danger. The first thing we'll do is go to the people who think just like us. <laughs> so we get them to confirm exactly what we want to hear. Okay, well, I did talk to someone, but I knew they were going to tell me what, exactly what I already believed, right? So we need multiple counselors. That's, what we're, that's how we really get the wisdom, seeking many counselors who can see things from different reference points of wisdom in knowing the Bible, some being more familiar with certain proverbs or certain scriptures that would apply than others, and also from different experiences in life, living out and experiencing the truth of these scriptures scriptures, but also just in their different life walks and wisdom and things they know from their own experiences, not necessarily just in terms of, of employment, but all different kinds of things in life, motherhood, fatherhood, um, dealing with certain difficulties in life that others haven't in God's providence been had to call to as much of others, or certain opportunities and blessings and how to make the most of them that others haven't had those direct experiences with as much. We need to get perspective in the multitude of counselors to help us make a well-informed decision. So we make a decision that is made, that is most likely to be wise, most likely to be safe. Otherwise, it may be that the first part of this verse befalls us and befalls others. Without such counsel, the people fall. The people perish. You know, sometimes I've, I think I've heard it translate an idea of uh, without, without vision, the people perish. There's no vision. There's no sense of where we need to go and how we need to get through whatever obstacles they are for the better good without seeking a multitude of counselors facing such a thing. 
Now, notice there's an antithetic parallelism going on here. In, in the Proverbs especially, also in the Psalms often, but especially in the Proverbs, there's usually a, a parallelism going on. Sometimes it's... Uh, synonymous parallelism where it's basically saying something and saying the same thing another way. Sometimes it's synthetic. There's kind of a saying one thing and then another thing or two that kind of amplify or add to the idea. Often it's a parallel idea of antithetic parallelism, two things that uh, oppose, uh, making, uh, emphasizing what you really need to know by contrasting it with what you really need to watch out for. And that's what we have in this text. Notice um, uh, the first part is where no counsel is, the people fall. Positively, if you get counsel that is by a multitude of counselors, the people are safe. But where no counsel is or little counsel or few counselors, the people fall. So by that contrast, it's simple. Well, I don't want to fall. I don't want to lead others to fall, especially in, in leadership of family, church or state. I need to be seeking counsel. I need to have the habit of regularly seeking wisdom and counsel, especially for significant decisions in life. Matthew Henry explains this verse, recognizing the contrast. He says, first of all, here is number one, the bad omen of a king's ruin. Where no counsel is, no consultation at all, but everything done rashly, or no prudent consultation for the common good, but only cabaling for parties and divided interests, the people fall, crumble into factions, fall to pieces, fall together by the ears, and fall in easy prey to their common enemies by a lack of counsel. You know, Jesus says, a house divided can't stand, it'll fall, right? And uh, I suppose there's that aspect of not seeking many counselors and seeking them together. A house is more likely to be divided and fall for lack of vision, for lack of leadership, bringing back to the people, here's the different counsel we've gotten, and here's why we think we're going this way. Want to seek your counsel as well moving forward. Uh, Matthew Henry points out the contrast with number two, the more positive side that we're focusing on today. He says here is number two, the good presage of a kingdom's prosperity. In the multitude of counselors that see their need one of another and act in concert and with concern for the public welfare, there is safety. For what prudent methods one discerns, not another, may in our private affairs, we shall often find it to our advantage to advise with many. If they agree in their advice, our way will be the more clear. If they differ, we shall hear what is to be said on all sides and be the better able to determine. You know, again, a lot of times I'll train, uh, sometimes I can drive people crazy because I kind of overdo exhausting all the options and revisiting and, okay, I want to ask you one more time. I've come back. I've learned this. What do you think about that? But so that I can make a really informed decision and then make a decision, a good one. And, you know, sometimes as you cons confer and look at different options, it helps you go back with more confidence to what you think you wanted to do. And some of getting the advice from others is realizing, yeah, that isn't as good or this isn't as good. I'm going to come back to this. Uh, even yesterday, we were helping Abraham look for a suit jacket and ended up getting a whole suit because as we went to different stores, consulted different options, got the feedback from different people, we found, wow, this is really the best opportunity. And how did we know and take it and jump on it? Because we'd already been exploring other options, thinking through different things. That's the way to approach life. Uh, certainly, you can't do that ad infinitum, uh, but there's an aspect of wisdom of what should be appropriate and adequate. And we see a good example of this in Acts chapter 15. This is really one of the primary chapters we turn to. And I'm not going to turn there with you, but just comment on it. Uh, the council at Jerusalem. This is one of the primary texts we look at for the example, the method and scripture of Christ's ordained church government. You might recognize, I think it's even tonight, when we're studying Christ's mediatorial office of king, I'm pretty sure the clause we look at tonight, if we didn't look last week, might have been last week, um, forgive me for being a little rusty, uh, is he gives us officers, right? He gives officers, to, yeah, it was last week we studied that together, right? He gives officers to the church. And we know, as we study more broadly, what it looks like. He has a system of government. It is a Presbyterian system. And what that means is it isn't one bishop leading the show. 
It isn't completely top down, you do whatever I say because I'm the top guy. It's not Episcopalian, it's not Roman Catholic, it is Presbyterian. There is a system of government of the church and it involves the plurality of elders. And by the way, our, our state government, our nation's government is based upon modeling this as wise. One guy doesn't run the show. There is a multitude of counselors. There's a plurality of elders. There's not just a pastor running the church or one elder. There are several elders that have to meet together and make decisions together. One cannot do so without consulting with the others. And we see that in Acts 15, the council at Jerusalem. They brought the different elders from the different churches together. They had a bit of a head panel guiding it. Uh, they had some who were James, I believe, not notice it wasn't Peter and Paul. They were bringing kind of things from the field to be discussed for the churches. And they counseled, they discussed, they came to decisions that they then sent back out to the churches. But it was a council. It was a number of equals thinking through and making a decision together. And that's how the church is to be led. That's a prime example of Presbyterian church government at every level, not just on the local church level, but at the broader level of Presbytery, in most cases, general assembly or, or synod. Elders, I want to encourage you all to keep our habit of waiting on important topics and responses until we first defer to a session meeting to inquire and to discuss. Often we need to gather information, get advice from others. But I mean, I know I find it so helpful to be able to say, especially when there might be pressure on a decision or advice, I say, you know, let, let me bring this to the session meeting, please. I, I really want to seek the other elders' opinion on this. Uh, I don't even choose what I'm going to preach on next without talking to session. They are overseeing worship. I'm not alone, and I want their advice and ideas and counsel. That's why, Lord willing, when I get through the preliminary research, I'm going to be preaching on Nehemiah. Why? Because that's what session requested, and they're thinking of different things and why it applies. So, great, great, let's do that. We're seeking wisdom, and we need to keep doing that as a session. We often want to keep first getting advice of several other pastors, several other sessions. Often, before we have a session meeting, uh, we're seeking in phone conversations and emails on important things, advice from others. Have you dealt with this? Especially if they're involved with a certain thing. You know, can you advise us on this? What are your thoughts? We want to check our work. And often it's to confirm that we are doing the right thing because we're certainly checking our work with the Council of our Westminster Standards and Book of Order. But, you know, there's a lot of details in between. We seek the Council of Books and Commentaries, including books that relate to the governance of the church. Bring those things together and then we have counsel with one another, sharing the counsel from everyone else so that we can make a good and wise decision praying for the Holy Spirit to guide us in Christ. We don't just kind of knee jerk it. Don't just kind of lick the finger, which way is the wind blowing? Oh, let's do that. That's not wise. And just deciding even as a session alone is unwise without seeking the counsel of Presbytery or other ministers, uh, other wise things. Sometimes the counsel is more related to business. Uh, you know, with all the things we've done with the business administration the last few years, sometimes it's just seeking counsel on how to approach this or that situation. We want to seek many counselors because it helps you not be hasty also. So often it helps you be careful because haste makes waste, as, an off, as is often said. It's kind of the same principle of measure twice, cut once, right? You know, that's the idea. Uh, it causes you to slow down and meditate and check yourself. But then, so that you can jump in head first, instead of just keep dipping your toes in the water. And that's something uh, I think, sadly, too many times Presbyterianism does lead up to never ever deciding anything or ever getting anything done. And I think sometimes people rest on their laurels as if that's good. It's not good. We're supposed to be making decisions and moving forward. Leadership is guidance, stepping out into the waters, parting the waters of the Jordan so the people can pass through and not have to stay on the other side of the Jordan, but get into the promised land. So you are to be studying and making decisions so that then you can decide and jump in head first, confidently, trusting the Lord not just dipping your toes in the water and never getting anywhere, you see. 
Sometimes we avoid making decisions because of a lack of counselors. Uh, also, so you don't sink, but you can strongly swim once you've made an informed decision confidently. It's not to avoid action, it's to take appropriate actions by multitude of counselors. Now, I often say to others who are seeking pastoral advice, you know, that's my guidance. I'm pretty convicted about it. I think this is the way to go, especially if they're not a member of our church. But even then, I would advise them to seek wisdom, especially from the other elders and you all as members. But I say, for the best course of action, you need to seek wisdom in many counselors. And I'll just kind of be loosely referring to this in other Proverbs. But seek wisdom in many counselors. Don't just go by what I say. Check it out with others, because I trust that the sweet truth will best permeate the whole cup of coffee when it has been stirred many times and from different directions. If my w advice is wise, it's going to be confirmed by others who are wise and truthful and concerned for your best interests. I don't need to be the authority or the only one on truth, you see. And of course, that would be unwise to treat any one pastor or elder or person as if they were. So seek multitude of uh, the wisdom in, in a multitude of counselors. Check what I say with others. Run it by them. And by all means, come back with what you've gotten from others, and I'm happy to comment. Consider. Because I trust that the Lord will let the truth rise to the top. You know, my mom loves to quote this old adage. You've probably heard it. Trust but verify. Trust, but verify. And there's that aspect of wisdom in many counselors. That's probably true. And isn't that really the spirit of the Bereans, right? They're more noble in Acts 17. They trust these things are probably true. They have a spirit of this is probably true, which is why they're willing to study it and find that it is true. But how do they do that? They search the scriptures daily. But in their case, probably didn't have Bible, certainly didn't have the New Testament. Where are they going to be seeking that truth? As Carl Truman points out in the churches, in public worship, you know, in studying the scriptures together. But have that disposition that it's probably true. But let me seek and make sure. Trust, but verify. Check out some different commentaries. Check out some different, see what the Westminster standards say about these things. Often many counselors is simply to confirm. Certainly there are many proverbs and scriptures that warn against getting wicked counsel. And only asking one or two people of the ilk who you know will only give you what your itching ears want to hear. We're not really looking at that today. We're assuming you're going to want counsel from the right people. And then the issue is a multitude of those kinds of people. But of course, keep in mind Psalm 1 and avoid getting counsel from those who would wickedly guide you. Heed the story of Rehoboam, for instance. Check not only the advice of others, but most importantly, check yourself and advice of those who have some miles under their belts. So you avoid the blind leading the blind. You know, we could be asking people who are well meant to know the scriptures, but for whatever reason, they're not as studied in something or not as experienced in something and really don't have a whole lot of counsel to give us and could be leading us blindly for simple ignorance. That is not a sinful thing. We need to be seeking it from those who Know from experience, know from the scriptures and the Holy Spirit guiding them. But do ask and listen to those who can help you see from their various perspectives that you might not. Seeking not only diversity over views, but also a common theme from those who have been there before you. You're looking for commonalities from all these different things. Yeah, I'm getting confirmation. This is the main theme I'm hearing. That's, that's really probably the main direction I want to go especially those who know the word better, who've been studying it, whose calling is to be able to advise you in it. And, of course, uh, from others in the church uh, who would do that. And who you see doing the same thing and reaping the right benefits. Observe people's lives. Look at their families. Watch their children. Observe this family of God observe commonalities and seek 
their guidance, especially from those who you recognize are living a Proverbs-driven life, if you will. I'm thinking of Anthony Savaggio's book, and therefore you'll see those effects the scriptures promise. Charles Bridges writes this about the verse. The agreement of the multitude gives safety to our decision. And even their difference by giving both sides of the question enables us to ponder our path more safely. The good Lord deliver us from the deserved national judgment of weak and blinded counselors. But in contrast, he says this, often has the church been preserved by this blessing. Now, of course, what's the other implication here? That you have the desire for counsel at all. But what else is involved? That as you would get it, including in multiple counselors, that you'd actually be teachable and willing to hear the counsel. Right? Nothing worse than people ask advice, but they won't give it. Or you try to give advice, you know they need it, and they block it off. Either a talk to the hand or fingers in the ears. Right? Somehow I think I know better than the professional. <laughs> right? You have to be willing to take and apply that advice if you want the promises that come with them. So R.F. Horton points out the danger of failing to take such advice, particularly for a lack of counselors at all. Now, he first has a chapter, chapter looking at themes of Proverbs called friendship. But the next chapter is about the opposite direction of friendship. It's called the evil of isolation. We American Christians and many Western Christians and stubborn Christians, we need to recognize how many times our Westminster standards teach about the evil of schism, let alone rugged individualism and I don't need anyone and I can just have church by myself and I can just go up to a mountain and, you know, church is my hiking that day or whatever. You know, I don't need the counsel of others. I'm fine. I got my Bible and God in me. Well, the God, God of the Bible and God's Bible says otherwise to that disposition away. And so in his chapter, The Evil of Isolation, where you're not going to get any counsel, let alone multiple, he cites Proverbs 18, verse 1. And again, this is a book on Proverbs. Uh, it says this, Through desire, a man having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. You know, there's even a danger with mutations if uh, family marries too close to family over a period of time. And uh, not that there isn't a place, uh, there's a certain level of what you can marry. That's in our Westminster Standards, actually, in the chapter on marriage. Uh, but even in that context, denominations that are smaller and often marrying quite a bit within, they tend to have certain things come up with genetic issues sometimes that cause problems. You know, diversity in the gene pool is healthful, health, helpful, healthy, similarly with counsel, diversity of opinions and it doesn't mean that you go the way of everyone. You have to make decisions that are wise, but you don't want to do it alone and think that you're going to come out not inbred in your own thinking that will ultimately mutate the way you think and live. Again, the evil of isolation, R.F. Horton writes, we are to think of a person who has no ties with any of his fellow creatures, distasteful. We are to think more especially of one who chooses this life of solitariness in order to follow out his own desire rather than from any necessity of circumstance or disposition. One who finds his pleasure in ignoring mankind and wishes for intercourse with them only that he may vent his spleen against them. In a word, we are to think of a misanthrope. What's a misanthrope? I had to look it up, but then I deleted it because he explains. Let me, let me go on. <laughs> the misanthrope is one who hath no faith in his fellows and shrinks into himself to escape them, who pursues his own private ends, avoiding all unnecessary speech with those who are around him, living alone, dying unobserved except for the mischief which consciously or unconsciously he does to those who survive him. 
Such an one is aptly described as showing his teeth in an angry snarl against all the approaches of a true wisdom. And by the way, he's quoting or alluding to Shakespeare that he then does quote a bit of, of a sonnet or whatever you would say from, I think it was Richard, uh, well, let me not show my ignorance and try to say offhand, uh, off the cuff, but he, he shows wisdom in quoting from a poet. He goes on to say, the sound wisdom against which the isolated rage is nothing, nothing less than the kindly law which makes us men and ordains that we should not live to ourselves alone, but should fulfill our noble part as members one of another. A man by himself is only an animal and a poor animal too. His distinction in the creation and his excelling dignity are derived from the social relations which make him in combination strong. In the intercourse of speech and thought, wise and in loving response of heart to heart, noble. He notes how God determined that it was not good for man to be alone. And so he gave Adam Eve. And husbands, I would call on you to recognize the importance of your wives being your helpmeet by being your most trusted advisor and counselor, including when they are trying to help you hear the advice of others you might be proving deaf to or hard of hearing. R.F. Horton goes on to write this. It becomes, therefore, a necessity to every wise human being to recognize, to maintain, and to cultivate all the wholesome relationships which make us truly human. Our life is rich and true and helpful just in proportion as we are entwined with those who live around us in bonds of mutual respect and consideration, of reciprocal helpfulness and service, of intimate and intelligent friendship. We can hardly probe to the depths of this proverbial philosophy without being aware that we are touching on an idea which is the mainspring of Christianity on its earthly and visible side. When we say to ourselves, we will live our Christian life alone, that is equivalent to saying we will not live the Christian life at all. Beloved, think of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The body of Christ. All the members of the body, Christ is the head. And one of the things Paul emphasizes there, one body part can't say to the other body part, I don't need you. And the parts that seem least important often are the most important. The most important. We need one another's perspective on moving forward as one body on the narrow way that leads to life. And we often need help and advice and guidance from others to stay on that way and not to get too close to the cliff. Remember Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now, first of all, do you want to know why that scripture comes to my mind so often thinking about such things? Because of our brother, now with the Lord, Bruce Ragland, would quote that so often by memory. And he's influenced me and counseled me in simply quoting it. He reminds me the scripture that says our hearts are deceitful, desperately wicked. Who can know it? The point is we often give ourselves bad advice. We often lie to ourselves. We need the advice of many counselors, so we stop lying to ourselves. And we listen. And we follow wise advice. Sometimes others have to loosen the pickle jar, <laughs> and then finally somebody else gets them to open it. 
but we're not going to get there on our own advising ourselves. Seeking the truth from others most importantly checks our own hearts and tests our motives and understanding and direction, often by asking us questions, helping us think through something, where we find ourselves, you know, you're right. Yeah, you know, you're right. I knew this was true. I just didn't really want to deal with it. That's why I'm talking to you. Or I knew that you'd probably confirm this, and I know it's true, but I need you to I need you to help me accept that and do it. And the more people you hear that from, the more, the more you're able to get it rolling, the more you're able to get yourself rolling with it. Whether you are on the narrow way that leads to life or the broad way that leads to destruction, it's often going to be determined in whether you're seeking and heeding and following the counsel of a multitude of people who know often better You know, sometimes we kind of say we're in the fishbowl, right? Or in ourselves, it's like we got the fishbowl on our head and we're just, the fish, you know, we can't see outside ourselves. We need the counsel of others. And sometimes we have to have people hammer us with it for a while because that fishbowl's made out of some kind of strong glass. I don't know, it just isn't going to break. But until we do, the water is just clouding our eyes and filling our ears. We can't hear or see what we need to know and what we need to do. Beloved, do you have an important life decision to make at the moment? Be sure to ask the advice of several different people you trust, especially those who show they trust Jesus, who is wisdom, and in his word you see they trust. And so often, I'm sure you've had this experience, I don't know why they didn't ask me about that before they made that decision, and I could have told them, and now they're paying for it. Now they got to get through this or that. They, they, they thought they knew better. They wouldn't listen or wouldn't ask. We don't want to get in those places, especially as we're leading others to follow us. Be sure to ask the advice of several different people you trust, who trust Jesus. You need help with finding a good job. Perhaps it's time to talk to a career counselor. Maybe you need to think about a resume a different way. Maybe you need to be thinking about certain other ways to find or certain things you might consider you didn't know were there or didn't know you might be a good fit for. You need help with finance, finances? Seek a financial counselor. Ask opinions of your brothers and friends to find the best one for you. In many areas of life, there are life coaches who have studied and prepared to be of service to you. But you must seek them out, and often, and not just one. Ask others if you can stop by to run by advice you need to get from them. Beloved, hear this simple counsel. As you're saying in Psalm 119, verse 24, thy testimonies are my delight and my counselors. And seek them out from elders and pastors who are supposed to be extra studied to be able to help give you advice from them. Seek it out from the Westminster Standards, which is intended to be your main resource to know the Christian life in belief and practice. Seek it out from Bible commentaries. Many. Don't go with one. Go with a number. Look for the commonalities of things. If you see something that's unique, test it with the others. Make sure that's what's really there. Frankly, what I love to do with you is mostly, as you see often in such a sermon today, is pass on things I've learned from others. I'm not interested in being original. I'm interested in giving you truth, the truth of the word and time tested from others. And often when it's original, especially if people working on their PhDs, it's usually dangerous. And I'm speaking of related to scripture, de de depending on the context and where it is. And by the way, I've often thought perhaps I'll go get my PhD, I'm not, but I've been advised by many about what to focus on. Otherwise, you have to come up with something which isn't necessarily there or doesn't deserve its emphasis. Isaiah 9, verse 6, you seek it of Christ, for to us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Be sure that you have bathed you're seeking of counsel 
and what you might decide in prayer. And often I'll hear people say, and we'll get letters, I've prayed about it, and it's very obvious they haven't. And it's very obvious they have not sought the counsel of the scriptures or the counsel of godly people based on what that decision is. I mean, it can't possibly be. It's just a phrase people throw out. I may have been thinking about it, but I don't think you've been praying about it. Because the Holy Spirit would never have guided you to make that decision that is clearly against what he has said in the Bible, which he wrote. I mean, I, I, I've even encountered a man many years ago in a church that I was at for a while who explained to me why he was seeing another woman, not his wife. And he had a good feeling about it. And I'm sure others gave him, uh, the people he wanted to gave him a good feeling about it. But it, it was not the counsel of God, nor godly people, and it will not be blessed. Quite the contrary. Seek the counsel of Christ in prayer. Seek the guidance and counsel of the Holy Spirit who is with you from Christ to counsel you until Christ returns in the flesh. John 16, 13, Jesus says, Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Notice the Holy Spirit doesn't speak of itself. There's a lot of certain movements that would try to say the Holy Spirit spoke to me. No, he didn't. He doesn't speak of himself. He's the spotlight that speaks of Christ. And he doesn't tell you to do anything that Christ told you not to do. And he doesn't have you focus on anything that Christ didn't tell you to focus on. Listen to the Holy Spirit who will guide you to understand and know his word and guide you to the right people that the word says to talk to. So you follow and keep Christ's commands. Proverbs 12, verse 20. Here are you going to see a number of Proverbs that are very similar to ours today. Proverbs eleven fourteen. Proverbs 12, verse 20. Deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil. But to the counselors of peace is joy. Now remember, peacemakers, that's the kingdom of heaven. But they're not the ones that say peace, peace when there is no peace. It's the right peace with God, the real peace. Often, as we saw in that scripture in Christ's Sermon on the Mount, peacemakers are the ones who will confront and deal with problems. People who are not real peacemakers will pretend there's peace when there isn't and avoid confrontation. Proverbs 15, 22. Without counsel, purposes are disappointed. But in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Let me, let me read that again. It's very similar. Proverbs 15, 22. Without counsel, purposes are disappointed. But in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Notice, you can ask someone, oh, you're disappointed. That didn't work out. Did you, did you get a lot of advice? Well, no. Well, sounds like the proverb showing itself to be true. <laughs> but notice in particular the emphasis on the multitude of counselors in this case. Proverbs 20, verse 18. Every purpose is established by counsel. If we would pray that the Lord would establish the work of our hands, according to other scriptures, he uses means. And that includes establishing it by getting counsel and with good advice make war. Proverbs 20, 18. Every purpose is established by counsel and with good advice make war. Proverbs 24, verse 6. For by wise counsel thou shalt make thy war. And in multitude of counselors there is safety. Again, in multitude of counselors, not just one, a multitude of counselors. Now think about this. A couple times, it's interesting, making war. Well, we can be thinking of spiritual warfare, but we have a brother in the military here. I'm pretty sure he's not going to feel too confident if they go out on the boat and there hasn't been much counsel. Not a good chance of winning a war that way. Pretty good chance of being sunk pretty quickly. You want leaders who are analyzing the details, analyzing the data, talking with others who have been there, know about the situation, so you are really wisely going in. Why? So you win the war. Now, certainly we're told to take up the armor of God, right? Ephesians 6, we're told to fight the good fight. How are we going to do that? A multitude, again, notice, a multitude of counselors. That's where the safety is. That's how you win the war against Satan. Satan wants you to act on impulse. 
Satan wants you to be rash and avoid the time it takes to get a counsel of many consultants. That's the way he's going to ruin you and others. Just do it off the cuff. Be impatient. I got one. That's fine. You know, any nonprofit I've worked for, you have to have a th three quotes at least from three different companies. Make sure you're getting the best price. But of course, sometimes the best price isn't the best service. You've got to weigh those things. Talking to others who have used the different services to get wisdom of what's really working best. Proverbs 27, verse 9. Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart. So doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty Counsel, hearty counsel. Yeah, we're not talking about five minutes of, you know, going through drive through And we're talking about talking to our friends who, by the way, remember faithful are the wounds of a friend. We'll think about that a little bit in tonight's message, not a lot. But hearty counsel. You got to be willing to have a good talk. You got to be willing to think. You got to be willing to consider and to do what this is saying, several conversations with different people, reviewing those conversations. Hearty counsel. But notice, it's like perfume. It's like sweetness in terms of the product you're going to get out of that. You know, it's the same way, you know, the scriptures talk about the most pure oil. Or, of course, the most pure perfume or water. I know I shared with years ago, we were up in L.A. once having to, uh, lunch at a place. We had water that had been filtered seven times. I've never tasted better water. It was unbelievable. I could have more of that water. It was so good. That constant. And, of course, the Proverbs are meant to be meditated on. As one of my professors said, and I know I've shared with you, they're meant to be sucked on like hard candy. Ruminate like a cow in its cud. Parents. Elders, ministers, leaders, and other aspects of life, you should be especially concerned with your leadership and your guidance of others. You see, the concern is not for our own choices so much, but how our choices affect and guide others. You know, we often just think about how is this choice going to affect me? I got to make a decision. But really, we should always be thinking about how is this choice going to affect others? And that's really in view here. Notice in all the scriptures where there's no counsel, the people fall. It doesn't say you're going to fall. The people fall. Especially who we are in leadership, we need to be thinking about how our leadership affects the rising or fall of others dependent on our guidance. And we need to be able to tell them, especially as a session, before we lead our church into something, especially if it's going to seem to go against the flow of popular opinion, but we believe it's the opinion of the scriptures, of the Holy Spirit, and of church history, we got to be able to say why. we got to be able to show and demonstrate we've studied to show ourselves approved. So we're making an informed decision that we're asking you to trust, and we're inviting you to study the same resources. The concern is not just for yourself. Of course, it applies to you, but it applies to all. Your choices, your decisions will always impact not only yourself, but everyone around you, and especially those under you. Your friends, your brethren, your children, even your parents. Go look ahead at chapter 10, verse 1. How you behave according to the scriptures and getting wisdom in many counselors affects everyone in your life. And the trouble is often we don't even stop to think about it, how it would affect anyone else. We're only thinking of ourselves, and that's when we don't get a lot of counsel. When we're thinking about how it affects others, we will carefully, deliberately seek wisdom in the multitude of counselors. Consider how even the pagans, Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar, sought the counsel of Joseph and Daniel, amidst many others, having many wise counselors, recognizing who were the best, telling the truth. And the counsel from God through such counselors saved many lives and provided prosperity for the people. As it is often said, there is safety in numbers. Our scripture is telling us there's safety in a multitude of counselors. Now, I know about you, but personally, I have never, ever found myself say, I didn't wish I wasted all that time talking to different people to get that advice. I wish I just decided it on my own. But I have regretted not getting wisdom by first seeking out the counsel of at least two or three other people who have expert training or extra experiences related to the thing I need wisdom in. 
often I have said, I am so glad that I talked to those other people. I'm so glad I sought that counsel from others. I would have made a big mistake. That would have been a big mistake. Or I've said, that was the best decision I've ever made. And I would never have seen it. I would never have the courage to make that decision without so-and-so advising and guiding and encouraging me. If you didn't get such advice and you have fallen on something, don't be further foolish by trying to get yourself out of it. Seek the help and guidance and support of others to lift you up and help you step up around such a pitfall next time. Remember, this whole book of Proverbs is advice from Solomon, who sought out wisdom from God more than anything else, and therefore more than anyone else, God gave him special wisdom. And he has this to give to you. And the Proverbs are that. The whole scriptures are, but the Proverbs are kind of in concentrated form for life. And he also offers you advice, I would argue, as you look at other parts of his life. And I think in Ecclesiastes too. But in the Proverbs, I believe Solomon's also offering you wisdom that he learned from his learning the hard way. And he would have you not have to learn it the same way through the school of hard knocks as you knock yourself and others down by not seeking wisdom in multiple counselors. But rather you get the tested truth of many who have studied to show themselves approved and who have shown a lifestyle that invites and follows the wisdom of many counselors in their own lives, including from these Proverbs. Now, remember a little while ago, we went to Proverbs 1, verse 5, and the message there, what we learned was to learn, learn to listen. To learn, learn to listen. We don't want to be that person people shake their heads at and say they don't listen. It's like talking to a wall. They already think they know. They got their minds made up. What's the point? And then you stop talking to them about certain things. Because they won't learn. And they won't learn by the failures when they keep not listening. We don't want to be that person. We need to listen if we're going to learn. But now today our Proverbs will push it a little further. Learn by listening. Learning to listen. And in this case, learn to listen to many people. Seek safe choices to guide others in many counselors. That's the message for you this morning from the text. Seek safe choices to guide others in many counselors. Let us pray. Oh Lord God, protect us from ourselves and our impulses. And lying to ourselves with deceitful hearts. Protect us from only getting a little bit of advice and from the wrong people. Help us to seek wisdom in a multitude of counselors, walking with the wise, that we would be wise and live wisely, and that rather than perishing, we would be safe. We would be saved, and we would thrive and prosper. Oh, Lord, bless us to be the kind of people learning to listen and follow the advice of many counselors that people would learn to find that they are wise to seek our wisdom and counsel along with others and when we give it let us always encourage don't just go by what i'm saying seek this out with others give us wisdom help us to live wisely in jesus christ who is the way the truth the life and the resurrection in his name we pray, and all your people said, Amen. Love lets us prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper. Would you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10? Right after Romans, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Look at verse 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? 
For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Now turn ahead with me to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Well, that last part said, I want to just read from our bulletin and the news you can use. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, in the weekly Lord's Supper here, just a note. Communicant members of Puritan Reformed Presbyterian Church partake during the end of each morning service of the Lord's Supper. Visitors who are covenanted communicant members in good standing within an evangelical church may partake after first visiting with the elders to share about their faith, confirm their formal fellowship, and explain their understanding of the elements. Elders are available upon advance request. Confirmation of church membership is required. Those not partaking are welcome to observe. To review articles about our policy and procedure of fencing the table, please see our website, practice what duty God requires of us. So I just note that, and we welcome anyone to approach us. And uh, if not in the visible church, we would love to have join our visible church and partake. Um, but just to explain, uh, as we uh, offer the supper this morning. And uh, I'd like to pray for us, and then I'm going to invite Elder Maxwell to come up, and I will uh, assist in serving the Lord's Supper. Of course, we're going to uh, 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 relieve uh, Elder uh, Renner of serving for a time as he heals up. But glad to, glad to serve him. Let's pray. O oh Lord in heaven, we do thank you for your body and blood. We thank you for saving us of our sins through your once and for all sacrifice on the cross, cleansing us by the blood of propitiation of our sins. We do thank you that you have cleansed us of all our sins. You've forgiven us of all our sins, past, present, and future. And you say, I do not condemn you and go and sin no more. We thank you also for your perfect life that you lived on our behalf in our humanity to credit us with your righteousness and the gift of everlasting life in the new heavens and earth in the presence of God who is holy, holy, holy. Lord, we recognize that there is salvation in no other but only in the Lord Jesus Christ, the only mediator between God and men. And we ask your blessing on this supper in our partaking of the elements of this bread and wine that we now set apart from a common to a holy use, reminding us that you have set us apart from this world to a holy use, kings and priests of a holy nation. Lord, we remember that your sacraments are to confirm your faithfulness to us. So let us be blessed by this partaking again. Soothe our souls, assure us of our salvation as you remind us that it is in you and not in ourselves. Bless us, O Lord, and assure us and strengthen us in our salvation as you confirm your covenant faithfulness to us. And let us respond in seeking to be more holy, thankful, and in love, keeping your commandments, growing in holiness. Be more faithful to you who are perfectly faithful to us. Thank you for this sign and seal of such a great salvation. Bless us in our participation of Christ as we eat your body and drink your blood. Strengthen and nourish us 
in serving you in the Christian faith until the day that the Lord Jesus Christ returns for us. And indeed, as we partake, let us proclaim Jesus until you return. Bless this means of grace to be effective unto your elect and a witness to the world. And we pray in Jesus' name and all your people said, Amen. Now I invite Elder Maxwell to assist me in serving you the body and blood of your Lord. <coughs> The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and also the cup, a sacramental act significant of his taking a human nature into union with his divine person. Following his command and example, I take this bread and this cup, and I exhibit them to you as the sacramental symbols of the body and blood of your Lord. After the Lord blessed the bread, he break it. A sacramental act significant of his sufferings and death upon the cross. Following his example, I break this bread. And we give it to you, his disciples. We elders will now serve you the body of Christ. Please wait to partake together upon our lead. Spiritually, but truly it is the Lord Jesus who is hosting the meal and who says to you, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In your partaking in the supper, the Lord Jesus is confirming to you that by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in. Though spiritually, yet truly, it is the Lord Jesus Christ holding this before you, hosting this meal of fellowship with you as a taste of the great supper of the Lamb when he returns. And he says, drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed 
for you for the remission of your sins. Excuse me, we need to pass it up. <laughs> if you don't mind, I, I'm realizing I, I went ahead. Let me say what I should have said to you first, just to make sure it's helpful. Um, and you're in the same manner, you can hold that if you don't mind, I'm sorry. <laughs> in the same manner, your Savior also took the cup. And having given thanks, he gave it to his disciples. So I, having given thanks and ministering in his name, give this cup to you. We elders will now serve you the blood of Christ. Please wait to partake together upon our lead. And I will uh, recite again what I did before to make sure that we receive it well. doesn't hurt to have it said another time. The Lord Jesus says to you, drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the remission of your sins. In your partaking, in participating with Christ, he's communicating to you and reaffirming to you that it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Let's pray. Lord God in heaven, thank you for such a great pledge of our salvation. Bless our body, bless our soul, to be rejoiced that we have been spared eternal hell, everlasting death. Because Jesus has taken that for us on the cross and given us eternal life through his perfect life. And you confirm this, you assure us with this now, and how we always need such assurance. Thank you for confirming your faithfulness to us, sealed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the blood of the everlasting covenant. Help us to grow in grace, including this means of grace, to serve you better this week. Thankful we serve in the context of our union with Christ and our identity in him as Christians. Thank you. Thank you for this sacrament. Let it be effectual to your elect and indeed a witness to all. We thank you in Jesus' name and all your people said, amen. Beloved, let's open this altar to Psalm 117. Please stand and we'll sing Psalm 117 together and then receive the benediction. Da 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 da. <clears throat> Pardon. Da 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 da. Oh, give ye praise unto the Lord, all nations that be.
for great to us word ever are his loving kindnesses his truth endures forevermore the lord oh do ye bless now receive the lord's benediction The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. You are dismissed.